I want to be very penetrating today. Penetrating to the point of, do you build your life on the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you building your life upon the sand that when the rains do come and the floods do rise and the winds do hit, you really don't have anything to hold on to? And the erosion of that water is going to take the foundation of sand away from your life. And your home, your life is going to fall. And great will be that fall when you have nothing to hold on to. But the winds can come. The storms can arise. And the floods can come up. And if our house is built upon the rock, it can beat upon that house. It may not be fun. But the storms of life will come. The calamities will take place. What do we hold on to? What do we stand on? Do we stand on the sand of shifting sand of stuff that will have no foundation? Or do we stand on the rock that I understand that the storms will come and the winds will come and the floods will rise, but I can stand firm in my home that I built, that I know that I can handle anything that comes my way. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean that you're going to have to deal with a lot of stuff. What it means is in the middle of the storm, in the middle of life calamities, in the middle of health, in the middle of financial distress, I know that the Lord is with me. If you have your Bibles, I want to read the very familiar scripture that we just sang about and we read in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus is talking to multitudes of people. And he gets right into their face. And this conclusion is so powerful that he ends one of the most powerful scriptures, the most powerful messages that he have, have ever written with a question and then an application to that question. Jesus didn't, Jesus can ask a lot of questions and he can give us a lot of answers. But when he asked the question here, he gave the application and he says this, but why do you call me Lord? Lord, and do not do the things which I say. You're following after me. And you call me Lord, and you want to learn about me. But once you leave me, you do nothing with me, and you don't pray with me, and you don't read what I have to say, and you don't do what I've asked you to do. Whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them, I'll show you whom he is like. So he's going to give us a parallel here. One that follows after Christ and one that does not follow after Christ. And here's the conclusion of verse 48. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the floods arose and the streams beat vehemently against the house and it could not shake it for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house upon the earth or the sand without a foundation against which when the streams beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. I'd like to give you two parallels today. Two parallels of our spiritual life and our physical life. Because the house that he's talking about is not necessarily a structure. The house that he's talking about is our life. And the first parallel I want to talk about is your life, is your home, is your foundation of your spiritual life built on the rock and the foundation of Jesus? Or is your life built on the sifting sand of culture? The, the popularity thing, the whatever we believe, and as long as I'm sincere in what I believe, I'm okay. But I want to tell you, Jesus gets into their face, and he says this. He said, I want you to know that if you do not build your home on the rock, your life upon the rock of Jesus Christ, when the winds and the storms do take place, it's going to take over your life, and great will be that fall. See, Jesus knows 
not only who he's talking about today, but he knows this is going to take, transcend time to us today. And great as that fall represents our salvation in Jesus. When we put our home, our life, and our foundation in Jesus, and the foundation is hit against the wind, against the, the stress of the rain, and the, the power of God hits upon us, either we're going to stand firm with Christ, or we're going to fall away from Christ. And when we fall, and our home is built on the sifting sand of culture, and we do not have Jesus, and you know the scripture when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the foundation. He's the foundation of our culture. He's the foundation of our life. And hopefully he's the foundation of your home. Because the opposite of heaven is hell. And if we do not build our foundation on the rock of Jesus Christ. And the rains and the storms and the judgment of God takes place within our life. And we are not built on Jesus Christ. The opposite of heaven is hell. The opposite of the presence of God is the absence of God. The presence of God is heaven. The absence of God is hell. And we spend our eternity someplace. And we make a lot of choices in life. We make choices of where we're going to go to school, who we're going to marry, where we're going to live, what we're going to do for a living. We make a lot of choices that last 30 or 40 or 50 years. And those choices are very important. But the foundational truth that what we have to hold on to is a spiritual principle. And that spiritual principle is I have made a decision. I'm going to build my home. I'm going to build my life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And when I build my home on the foundation of Jesus Christ, I understand that God is not a respecter of persons. He's going to reign on the just and on the unjust. He's going, problems are going to take place for those that are good and those that are bad. Those that go to church and those that do not go to church. Those that give and those that do not give are not going to hold back the judgments of God. But when the winds do take place, and the storm does come. Sometimes we hold on to those storms and we see the storms coming. We hear the Doppler radar. We know that the tornado is going to take place and we can take shelter because those are storms of life. But how many of us understand that storms of our spiritual life, our physical life, we do not have a Doppler radar system that's going to take place. Say, tomorrow morning, you're going to have a calamity to take place. Those calamities take place without us any having any warning. And what we have to do is we have to be able to hold on. We have to dig down deep and understand the principles and the foundation of my life has to be built strong on the rock. It can't just be on the shift, sifting sand. Because if it's on the sifting, shifting sand, what happens is that sand erodes. We have nothing to hold on to. And sometimes in the culture of Israel, they would build their homes on, on riverbeds. Because they wanted to be close to the water. And they would build their houses there. And most houses looked identical. You could look at a house that was built on the sand. Or the house that was built on the rock. And there would be no difference. The difference is the foundation that it is built on. And sometimes you have to dig deep into the sand of culture. To get to the rock and the foundation. And if you build your home upon the rock. And sometimes it takes work. As we talked last week, we have to dig down deep sometimes. We can't focus on the dirt. We have to focus on the foundation. We dig down deep and we build our home on a foundation. On the rock of Jesus Christ. On the rock of solid foundation. Then when the rains do hit our house. And do hit our homes. And do hit our life. We can stand firm. The houses look identical. You could walk by and say that house is strong or that house is strong or we could look at your life and you would look no different than somebody that's across the hallway. And your house, your home, your life looks the same. Let me tell you when you can tell the difference. You can tell the difference when the storms come. You can tell the difference when the rain of life, the foundation of life hits us and we don't know who to hold on to. We have no hope and we have no faith in ourselves. We have no faith in God because we have no relationship. Because we don't obey, we don't listen, we don't care. But 
that same home that looks the same as the one that was built on the sand that's built on the rock. The storms can come. It can beat hard against that house because it doesn't make any difference. The storms of life will come. But when the storm of life comes and hits hard against the house that was built upon the rock, that house is not going to buckle because it's firmly founded in the process of Jesus Christ. So in our life, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but yet you don't do the things that I've asked you to do? In other words, why are we playing the game of Christianity, but yet not listen to what Christ has in store for us? I want to give you a couple principles, and I want to finish with some, some application. The parable is, I could call it Jesus' residential construction plan. See, Jesus was a carpenter. And if we understand the idea of Israel, a carpenter translated is a builder. We think of a carpenter as somebody that just builds with wood. But Jesus was a builder. And in Israel, they didn't have a lot of wood, but they had a lot of stone. So their homes were built upon stone or rock. So Jesus would understand the parable of be, building the house upon rock. And sometimes when we build our house upon the rock, it can stand. And Jesus is talking to his Jews and he is saying, listen guys, there's something very important. If you do not build your house upon the rock, things can take place. In verse 49, but he who heard it and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation. Against when streams come on and hit it, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So we understand that there's two aspects. He's a builder, but then we understand the spiritual principle. The spiritual principle is this. There's three aspects. A wise man came to Jesus, and he hears his word and obeys them. So let me give the spiritual principle. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Notice the three stages of verse 47. The three stages is a man came. And they called him Lord. And they heard his word. And they obeyed. Or they disobeyed. Since you are here today. You are probably obeying Christ. You probably are hearing his word. You love Jesus. Or you love the aspect of Jesus. So we can hear his word. The aspect of this is you come to church because you love Jesus. Or you love the idea of Jesus. Or Christianity. And you hear his word. Maybe you pray. Maybe you listen to what the Bible says. Or you listen to what a preacher says. There's one difference in the spiritual principle, one man listened and obeyed. We don't like that word obey, do we? Obey simply means I'm under. I have to obey authority over. And sometimes we have to be humbled enough to understand if I obey somebody, that means there's somebody that's over me or somebody that I respect. And to be humbled before God, we have to obey God and obeying God means I'm going to listen to what he has to say I'm going to love him and I'm going to do what he asks if we come to the Lord and we listen to him but yet we say not me we are not humbled underneath him the person you have to put into practice what you learn this word obey means a continual well, willing to obey and to put in practice the words of Jesus. Sometimes we have to just understand I need to go, I need to learn, and I need to obey. But he also said there's somebody else. He called it a fool. He says, you come to Jesus and you hear his words. You, you, you come to Jesus, you understand who Jesus is. And you hear his words, you hear the preaching, you, you read the Bible, and you understand a lot about what he says. But the difference between the two men is the last point. And doesn't 
obey it. And doesn't obey it. I like what it says. It's good for Kevin. Kevin, you ought to obey what the Bible says. It'd be good for you. It's good for your marriage. It's good for your finances. It's good for relationships. But it's not good for me. Because for me to obey it means I can't do what I want. I means I have to kind of do what God wants. And sometimes that's not exactly what I want to do. So we see what the parable is and we see what the spiritual application is. The wise man and the foolish man. So I need you to put yourself in one of those two categories. And only you know. Because I can look at you and I can say wise man, wise man, wise man. I could look at Bryson and I say foolish man. I could look at all these people and I can choose and, and I can see exactly who I think you are. And we can put on our, our facade and we can come to church and we can be whoever we want to be in church. But when we walk out of church and we go to our homes, we go to work, and the storms of life hit us. And the winds hit upon our life. And we struggle. And see, the floods usually don't happen instantaneously. The storms come first, then the winds hit. But floods, they can come after the storm. And we have something deep within us that we can stand and we can fight and we can, we can put our sandbags down and we can plywood up our windows and we can be ready for the storm. And when that storm hits, I can stand against the storm. But those floods cause damage, don't they? They can start slowly. And they can creep up and come close to the house. And they can go all around your house. But all of a sudden, those floods start coming into the house. And sometimes because your house is lower than my house, your house gets flooded. And I can say, I'm glad I'm not you. I'm glad I'm not doing what you do. But then sometimes those storms and those floods keep on coming. And you can't stop the floods. And I believe sometimes that God is talking about the floods being the psychological aspects of storms. And sometimes we can stand firm against the storm. But over and over and over and over and over again, those storms keep on coming. And they hit us emotionally. And it causes us stress within our life because storms and floods don't quit. And sometimes because of our past, those storms mean so much more. Sometimes we can deal with a storm, but sooner or later that a storm turns into two storms and three storms and four storms and those floods keep on coming up and those floods causes devastation. So I want to give you five points in the personal application. You know where you are. I don't know where you are. Because I look at your life and I see the same as my life. I see your house and I see the same as my house. They look the same. They look like they're built well. You come to church, your, your foundation is strong. Only you know what you go through during the times of storms. Only you know what your house is built on. Only you know whether your house is built on the foundation of the rock of Jesus Christ or on the sand that's going to be shifting. Only you know when calamities take place that you wonder what in the world is going to take place or do you fall on your knees and say, God, I need you. I was very privileged over the last month to have hundreds of people, even thousands of people all over the world praying for me. Praying for my health and praying for my recovery uh, because I, I, was, I was nervous. A storm hit me head on. And I want to tell you that when you look at my life and you look at what I built my house on, my personal life on, 
if it wasn't for the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when I was hurting, people praying. When I went to the doctor the week after I got back home, after times of the emergency room and ICU for over two weeks, he looked at me and he said, this does not make sense. This does not make sense. He said, uh, with what you had and what you went through and the aneurysm and the stroke that you had, and this was three weeks after, he goes, this doesn't happen. And uh, I put a smile on my face. And I said, you know why it happened? It's because God took care of me. And he held up a card. And a card had 42 on it. And I've shared this with you. He said 42% of the people that come in here are like you. Never go out whole. And within three weeks of leaving that hospital, I was up here talking to you with a clear heart, a clear mind, with no side effects other than just a little bit of eyesight that the doctor said that within two or three weeks, it'll go away. I want to say I love building my foundation in my life on the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've had people email me, text me from around the world that I know as missionaries and say, we're praying for you. We know it's going to be okay. I go to the grocery store. People I don't even know say, hey, pastor, what are you doing? I say, I'm buying groceries. What are you doing out of bed? I don't know. I'm getting groceries. I'm getting gas. What are you doing getting gas? You should be in bed. I'm not staying in bed. I'm, I need to get out. I need to have my independence. I, I had a seizure, and they say, what are you doing driving? I say, shh, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. I got, I got to get out. So when calamities take place, I had no idea from one day to the next the calamity that I was going to be in. So this sermon, these next five points that I had to have myself because this is a sermon I want to give to me before I give to you. Storm will come within to your life. Storms are going to come. It makes no difference. It would be great if we lived in a Christian bubble. That once I gave my life to Christ, I would have no calamities, I would have no storms. But unfortunately, storms come. Calamities take place and your life, just like my life, can have major havoc. And the storms can beat so hard within our life. And the winds can beat us to a point that we want to give up. And then after the storms come, and the winds come, and we, oh, we made it through the storm, comes the flood. Devastation of water. If you've ever had a home that's been flooded, it is catastrophic. I'd much rather live with a tornado than live with a hurricane any day of the week. Somebody give me an Amen. But at least we know they're coming. At least we can take preparation. Maybe the rebuilding is tough. But in John chapter 16 verse 33. These things I have spoken to you. That in me you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. See God reigns his judgment on the just. And on the unjust. That means nobody's safe from the storms of life. I heard the illustration of a pastor that went on vacation and uh, he was coming back from vacation. He heard a tornado came through Kansas and uh, he, was, he was going to Walmart. He had to get some gas before he went home and he met one of his church members and one of his church members said, Pastor, he said, uh, my house is ruined. It's off its foundation. And the preacher looked at him very smug and he said, well, you know what? That's the judgment of God upon your life. You have sin within your life and, you know, you're goofing around and you're not tithing and all kinds of stuff's taking place within your life. And that's just God telling you that you need to straighten up your life. And the man said, well, okay, but preacher, I want you to know your house is demolished too. <laughs> so it makes no difference. God 
makes it rain on the just and on the unjust. Not just the sinner and the saint, but all of us are going to be judged by what God has done within our life. The rain will come and the storms will take place. But the second point is this. In the building a shelter or your life, you are building a shelter of your life against the storms. In the midst of the storm right now, or simply the calm before the storm, we are building our life for a storm. And sometimes we do really not like the way the storm is going to take place. But we think it will never happen to me. That's for somebody else. I'm going to walk through my life without the calamities, without the problems. But you know what? Storms take place. And as I said before, it'd be nice in our storms if we had a spiritual Doppler radar. Wouldn't it be nice? And sometimes the TV goes off or the radio go goes off and blurts out and says, uh, be careful, be careful. In the next two hours, a calamity is going to take place. But in our spiritual life, we do not have Doppler radar. We do not have any idea what's going to take place. We don't know when the phone is going to ring and we don't know when things are going to take place. But we are building our home against the shelters and storm. And how are we building that house? See, sometimes we like the easy believism or the easy Christianity that as long as I come to church, as long as I have a Bible, as long as I say my prayer before dinner or before I go to bed, I'm safe and I'm good. Well, that's building your house upon the sand. Because let me tell you what building your house upon the rock looks like. That means I'm intentionally going to be who God wants me to be. I'm intentionally going to build my house upon the rock. I'm intentionally going to do certain things. Most storms strike suddenly without warning. And if we are not building our house upon the rock, we are in deep trouble. And we have no place to turn. We make some phone calls. We ask people to pray for us. And sometimes we fall on our face before God and say, God, why me? And the difference between Somebody that builds their house upon the, storm, on the sand and the house upon the rock is this. They know. They know what they need to do. And they fall on their face before God and they say, Lord, help me. But one that built his foundation or his life upon the storm gets mad at God. And says, God, why would you do this to me? And we have to remember that God is not a respecter of persons and God is going to bring judgment upon those that are right and those that are wrong. And the storms of our life can falter and what we built our home upon will stand. In the storms you discover the stability of the foundation. In the storm, the stability of your foundation. Now, let me, let me get, let's just have a little poll. How many of you guys have had a storm within your life? How many of you guys have gone through a divorce, have gone through financial crisis, gone through kids that are going wayward, and, and you, just, you, you just don't know what to do? You say, oh, I thought I did the right thing. I thought I did what's right. And the homes look identical until the storms hit. And when the storms hit, you have to realize what I'm going to do is I have to trust in the foundation that I built. When those kids graduate from high school and they're gone, did I give to them the foundational principles that I'm going to build my home on the rock of Jesus Christ? When I built my home on the rock of Jesus Christ, I understand, Dar the Darnells understand that, that when their daughter was in Las Vegas during the shooting, that she was on TV and she, she, she went through a storm. And troubles. And she could stand up and say, you know what? It was okay. When trials and storms take place. 
and the winds and the storms hit against your foundational principles, are you building your principles on the rock of Jesus Christ? Or are you building on the land, on the sifting sand? So, sometimes we have to storm-proof our life. And how do we storm-proof our life? It's sometimes we have to dig deep and get rid of the dirt and build upon the rock of total obedience. See, the idea, sometimes we want our life to be fixed instantaneously. You, you come into church or you go to a crusade or you go to camp and you raise your hand and say, I want to give my life to Christ. And you expect because you gave your life to Christ at camp or at church, the next day you're going to be off the bottle and be off the pills and your confusion is not going to be bad and everything's going to be wonderful and everything is fine. So you build your house upon the sand. You're, you want to do right and you're trying to do right but you, you, you want to come to church, but to build your house on the rock is saying this, I've got to change things within my life. I've got to do the hard things. I have to dig deep through the sand upon the rock and build my pillars upon my home on the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because some often we want some belie easy believism and we just build our house upon the church. Build our house upon my husband. Or build my house upon my wife. Build my house upon the sand. And when we build our house upon the husband. And then the husband leaves. I have no foundation. We build our foundation upon our finances. And on the things that we have. And then the stock market falls apart. Or you lose your job. And you don't have any money. You have no foundation. And because the church is going through calamity. And you put your hope in the church. And you find out that the church can't save you. They can pray with you. But the church can't take over your life. And you find out that that's easy believism. And when I was a youth pastor. I went to a camp one time. And uh, I liked the numbers. But I didn't like the outcome. He had a full house of. I don't know how many hundreds of kids. And he, ra he asked this one question. How many of you do not want to go to hell? Okay, how, let me ask. How many of you do not want to go to hell? He goes, say this simple prayer. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Let us not go to hell. Amen. Hundreds of kids at that time was told, you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Your destination is not hell. Your destination is heaven because you raised your hand and you said a prayer. You know what that's called? A lie. That's easy believism. Do you know what Jesus did? Jesus came to this world and lived 33 years and he died on the cross and suffered a shameful death for you not to have easy believism but for you to understand that my atonement was Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ shed his blood for my sins and I ought to say thanks to Jesus. Not just I don't want to go to hell. No, I get to go to heaven because what Jesus Christ has done for me. Hell is a real literal place. Heaven is a real literal place. And if I do not put my faith in Christ in my foundation, I am going to be shaken to the core. But the fifth point. You haven't faced your biggest storm yet. Oh, really? I got more storms? I'd like to be an obedient disciple of Jesus. But it makes no difference we are going to hit some storms. I've been through a lot of family members that have gone through major storms. Let me just, let's, let's have a poll. How many of you uh, in this church, you've had a major calamity in your life? And I, as your pastor, had the privilege of either helping you through the calamity, through a funeral, through a death, through surgery that I've, I've tried to help you through that. Just raise your hand. It's all over the place. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something. That storm was real. And the pain that you felt 
was overwhelming. But there's storms that are going to come. There's storms that are going to arise. But I want to let you know something. There's one storm that we cannot hide from. And hopefully many of you have dealt with this storm. And many of you have given your life to Jesus. Because that foundation that you give your life to Christ is the most important thing. But in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me then that day, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied in your name. And cast out many demons in your name. And done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The biggest storm is this. Those that have come to church. Those that hear the word of God. Those that enjoy church for all kinds of reasons. But those that have never really given their life to Christ. Why do you call me Lord, Lord and do not do the things that I ask you? It's a major question. And I believe our churches today are full of people that love Jesus. They just don't obey him. They want to build their house upon the rock, but it's just too much work. They want to do what God wants them to do, but they really don't know how. And in that time, it's devastating. See, in 1900, was the worst hurricane ever that hit the United States of America. Anybody know where that hurricane was? Galveston, Texas. And in Galveston, Texas... In 1900, there were 6,000 people that died. And another 6,000 in the surrounding areas outside of Galveston. It was a major, major calamity. To a point that they were wondering whether they were going to evacuate the south end of Texas and not have any more homes in the Galveston area. But the Corps of Engineers came together and they said, we can fix this. And they brought in, let me get my right number here. They brought in 16 million cubic yards of dirt and sand. Comprehend that. 16 million cubic, cubic yards of dirt and sand. And raised the entire Galveston Island 12 feet. And then they built a seawall. That when the rains and the waves came in, it hit the seawall. And that seawall would hold and the storms would not come in and the floods would not come in. But unfortunately, 15 years later, there was another catastrophic hurricane that hit Galveston. The difference between 1900 and 1915. There were 12,000 that died in 1900. And there were 275 that died in 2015. What is the difference? Well, the difference is they made a decision. They made a decision that they were not going to build their homes and build their workplace on the sifting sand of the shore. They were going to dig down deep into the rock and they were going to build their home on a foundation that will stand. It doesn't say in Luke chapter 6 that the house came down and the, the guy died. It said the great was that fall. I believe that God is a God of first, second, third, and in my case, ten chances. As Al plays in golf, mulligans. I mean, he uses the mulligan on every hole. And, and he, 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 says, he says, well, I beat you today. Well, of course you beat me. I mean, you use mulligans all the time. So, sometimes we need a mulligan. Sometimes we need a redo. Sometimes we look at our life and we come to a calamity, a storm. And we don't know what to do. I hope today is a day that we can say this. I'm tired of my home 
being on the sand. I'm tired of the fear of what's going to take place tomorrow. I need to dig deep on the rock of Jesus Christ. On the foundation that he can give to us. And say, I want to put my faith and my trust in him. Because I can't put my faith on the sand of culture. On the sand of my finances. On my husband or on my kids. I got to put my faith and my foundation on the rock of Jesus Christ. Because whether you're in it now. Or whether it's next month or next year. Another storm is going to take place. And if you don't have your rock solid foundation. That wind is going to beat so hard against your house. To a point that the house could fall. And that fall could be great. But it could be back in 1915. When you decided no more. I'm going to redo my house. I'm going to upgrade. And I'm going to build a foundation. Because the houses look identical. The only difference in your house and my house. Is not what we put in the house. Not how we decorate the house. Not even the roof of the house. It's something that we never see. I don't see your foundation. Nor do you see my foundation. And the only times that we see the foundation of our lives. Is when the storms come. And the floods hit. Is the foundation of your life. Built on the rock of Jesus Christ. Or. Is the foundation of your life on the sifting sand. That when the sand erodes. And the things that you hold on to are wavering. And you have no hope. And you have no help. And your home falls. The storms are going to come. My storm came. Your storm's going to come. Maybe we've gone through storms. But what do we do with the storm that comes in? There's a song that uh, it used to be the old song that we used to sing all the time. And it's talking about the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ, the foundation of our life is so, so important. Because the rock is Jesus and the foundation is strong. I just want to ask you one question in closing. Why? Do you call me Lord, Lord? And don't do what I ask you to do. Why do you call yourself a Christian? And you don't even follow what I've asked you to do. Why do you call me Savior? But yet you don't care about what I do. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And never talk to anybody about what he's done for you. Because I believe churches are full of people that enjoy church but they really don't care about Jesus I believe the church is full of people that read the Bible but don't really apply the Bible I believe the church is full of people that are captivated by the culture that love what people think about us but we do not care to change the world I believe the church is full of people just like you and just like me that are very happy until the storm hits. And when the storm hits and the rains come down and the wind hit against us to a point that is very frustrating and we can stand against the storm of today but then the floods the flood of emotion, the flood of failure keeps on rising and rising and rising. And our homes, our lives are demolished. What do we hold on to? If you had nothing left, 
If the hurricane or the tornado would come through your home, through your life, and it would hit, would you be frustrated to a point, give up? Or would you be able to say, I'm still alive. My kids are safe. I can start over. Because the things of this world are not as important to me as my faith in our Lord. Because it's just stuff. It's just stuff. God has given to us 70 years. What we accumulate is just stuff. What we have to hold on to is the foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're going through a storm. And the storm is hitting you and it's hitting you hard. And you may be able to put on the face and say everything's wonderful, everything's great. But you're knee deep in flood waters. And your emotion, your stress, your life is in chaos. I can only do one thing for you. Build your house over. And when you build your house over, your home over, your life over, don't build it on the sand of culture. Build it upon the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the winds, the storms, they're going to come. And they're going to be strong. And there's going to be things said and things done and people hurt and even people die. And you're not going to have anything to hold on to if you do not have the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ. So my invitation, if you're in the middle of a storm, if you just got out of a storm and you gave God the glory or you got out of one of your storms and you had no idea what to do and your life is in chaos. You need some help. And the church can give you help, but Jesus can give you rescue. And if you need prayer, if you need to start your life over, if you need to dig deep into the foundation of this earth on the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ, do it. I, I, I don't like using myself as an illustration. But I, in the last few weeks, I was rocked. I was rocked. And I hope you've noticed over the last few weeks that I don't want to make you happy. I don't care if I really upset you. I just want to give you truth. And I believe sometimes the church is full of people that enjoy church but really don't have a foundation of Jesus. And I need you to have that foundation that when the calamity of your life hits, that you're laying flat on your back and you have no hope and you don't know whether you're going to live another day. And you may not have time to redig that well. That you choose how you live today. You choose how you're going to stand against the storms today. Because the storm is not going to respect you and say, oh, because it's you, I'm not going to hit your house. Because it's you, I'm not going to bother you. The flood will come all around Wichita, but your house will be safe. God says, I reign on the just and on the unjust. It's what you do before the rain hits that counts. And is your home, is your life built upon the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ? I want you to answer this one question. Why? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And not do the things I ask you to do. He's talking to a bunch of people. That followed after him. But didn't believe in him. And I believe there's so many times. In the same way that we have in our culture today. We can raise our hands. And we can sing praise songs to Jesus. 
and we can come to church and we can open up the Bible and we can say yeah that's good for somebody else or that may be a good story or he did a good job on the sermon but we walk out the door and we never obey what we know we say not me and that's good for somebody else but that's not good for me then that question is penetrating to you why this is Jesus why do you call me Lord Lord and you don't even do anything I ask you to do in other words he's saying you're not my child you can do all kinds of great things but unless you do what I've asked you to do you're not a disciple of mine and I want to challenge you if you're not following after Christ if you're not obeying what Christ has asked you to do if you're not taking a step and do what God wants you to do Jesus himself could be in your living room and saying why why are you playing the game but yet not following after what I asked you to do the storm will come the rivers will rise the winds will hit your house and my house the only difference is my house is built on the rock on the foundation of Jesus and I hope your house is but many of our houses are built upon the sand and that sand is going to erode and great will be the fall of that house or your life because you do not have your life built on Jesus Christ.